From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and here's what's ahead. K-State's Deanne Presley will discuss a cover crop option for you row crop growers to consider, planting cereal rye immediately after corn and ahead of soybeans. She'll talk about the weed control and water conservation gains that can be made with a good stand of cereal rye between those two cash crops. Then from the latest Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State, a look at the economics of putting up native grass hay, including a comparison of net-wrapped and twine-tied bales. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Ward Upham on planting a fall cool season vegetable garden. All that and more next on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Thanks for tuning in once again for this Agriculture Today. Well, on the first segment of today's broadcast, we'll let you know about a new publication out of K-State and the Midwest Cover Crop Council. And it's on a cover crop option that you corn producers might want to be thinking about here as your crops push on to harvest time. That would be cereal rye planted after corn. Talking with us now is Deanne Presley, Deanne Soil Management Specialist with K-State Research and Extension, and she's been involved in the development of this new publication. So, Deanne, we talk cover crops in many forms and fashions here, but here's an idea that you think could well have merit for our cropping systems here in Kansas. That's right. You know, there are a lot of different cover crops, and if you wanted to have that conversation about what cover crop it when what t- cropping system, it can get to be a long conversation, right. but a very easy one. And that's why we call this a recipe because you could literally follow it like a cooking recipe. Personally, I'm not the best cook, so I like recipes, especially when I'm trying something new. So this one is for after corn, planting cereal rye, with the idea of being soybeans to follow. So we wrote up a really easy to follow two pager on how to do it. What do you need to think about and timing and things like that. What is then the purpose of cereal rye for this period between corn and soybeans? What are the objectives of planting it? Well, the the main objective is so that you have even more dead residue next year to help keep your beans nice and clean during the growing season. So the dead cereal rye residue, it's light colored. It can reflect sunlight. And um, the cereal rye, so when the cereal rye is growing, it outcompetes other weeds that might be growing, so your winter annual weeds. And then once you spray it, kill it, it's light colored, reflects sunlight, and it conserves soil moisture. So those are its two main salient points is competition with resources to keep weeds down and also reducing evapotranspiration, evaporation, I should say, that part of the equation. And that's that latter part is something folks might not think about, that one can actually save water resources to a certain extent with this cover crop. Right. Although it's a bit of a teeter-totter because you might think, well, growing something over that winter time that's going to use moisture, it definitely does. It uses moisture to grow the biomass of that crop, and then you spray it out and it lays there dead. So it has used moisture. So if it was like a super dry spring, early spring next year, then the recommendation might be to get out there and terminate that cereal right earlier rather than and letting it go longer and get too dry for your soybean crop coming up. And long term, lots of different research has shown this usually works out pretty well in the, let's say, 28 inches of rain and above zone for sure. We usually have enough rain, enough precipitation where this ends up being beneficial. Why, though, cereal rye as opposed to another small grain, say, like wheat, for instance, that could be planted in the fall? You know, actually, that one works good, too. Wheat works well. Cereal rye works well. Triticale can work well. Barley, we've done work with all of those. They all work well, but cereal rye is the one that takes the most abuse. We can plant it the latest. I have messed up 
with Serial Rye numerous times and not done things exactly how I wanted to, but, you know, it rained, so I couldn't get it planted as soon as I want. It seems to me like it takes a little more abuse. But if you're like, I don't want Serial Rye anywhere near my fields because maybe you're producing seed wheat, well, then, you know, any of those other cereals work really well, too. Uh, But as you're suggesting with rye being a concern for wheat growers, Rye will grow quite aggressively, so it establishes quickly, one presumes. Yes, it establishes quickly. It grows really well. It puts on pretty good amount of biomass. Another one is annual ryegrass. That's one that is popular a little bit more in the Corn Belt. And annual ryegrass, it's kind of claim to fame is the fact that it's got a really good root system underneath it, and that can be a good one too. But I actually think where we're more moisture limited than the eastern Corn Belt, I think for us, it's getting a lot of that top, a lot of the tops, right? So a lot of biomass to get dead biomass, then shading the surface, keeping it light colored and holding moisture in is what makes cereal rye so much more beneficial. I'm just I'm just not as into annual ryegrass here where we're just a little bit drier. Well, then, Deanne, getting this cereal rye stand established in corn residue and one is no tilling this in? You can do whatever you want. So that's the beauty of cover crops. So you could broadcast them. Uh, if you're going to broadcast them, so either with an airplane or by overseeding. And um, now the the Kansas Department of Health and Environment has purchased some high boy seeders for cover crops to try to promote this cover crop usage. Um, there's multiples of those out there um, where they've kind of done a cooperation with co-ops to get these out there or ag retailers, I should say. So that can that can be done. Um, the thing with broadcasting is that you usually have to broadcast a higher seeding rate just because more of those seeds aren't going to come up because there's poor seed to soil contact or drilling them in. So obviously with drilling, you got to do that. You'd want to do that right after you get the crop off and then go drill it right away. But you can broadcast. Like I said, you could fly it on. You could broadcast seed it, do whatever. Some people, uh, this is a little more eastern, or the, the Corn Belt, where they will apply this and then they might vertical tillage over the top of it. Um, so broadcast it or even put the broadcaster on the front of the vertical tillage tool. So you can do it however you want, honestly. In fact, I've had the question and I've been kicking around the thought for doing some research on well, what about cover crops for tillage farmers? Sure, why not? I think of it like the goose with the golden egg. Soil is you can't just take, 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 take forever and expect it to respond well and produce good crops. But if you can add something back in, cover crops are like replenishing they're good for soil. That's what they really are, is they're they're for the soil. People think, well, could you graze them? Sure. That's another conversation, though, too, to kind of go down. If you want to have that let's graze it conversation, then we might design something slightly different. But if you're not going to graze it, again, this is where cereal rye works really, really well. The, the It produces just the right amount of biomass. Now, you can let it grow and get really crazy and really tall. I don't know that I'd suggest that. It's because you have to be able to get your soybeans planted the next year, right? So that's you have to know what you're going to – you have to have your plan and then terminate it and manage it correctly, which is – where I like to hand that conversation off to our weed scientist, Sarah Lancaster, to have have that side of the conversation. But, um, you know, I say that's the thing about cover crops is just planning. It does take more planning, mental planning here. But if you're thinking about trying it for the first time, this is the best, like, gateway cover crop (laughs) and the best spot to do it uh, in that rotation. Now, a finer point here, but you're planting after corn. Mm -hmm. Does one need to worry about residual herbicide applied to that corn crop whatsoever? Uh, Not so much because they're both grasses, right? So cereal rye and corn are going to be fairly similar, I think, in terms of their, you know, herbicide chemistries that might bother them. But that's a great question if you're going to print a broadleaf or a legume. You would have to think that one through a lot more carefully. And that is, again, a a Sarah question (laughs) I like to say for her, but... That's a very important thing. I always think about your cover. You got like a Venn diagram. You got your circle of decisions with your cash crop, your circle of decisions with your cover crop, and then they overlap. So you got your decisions that, okay, well, how do these affect each other? Because Lord knows we don't want to affect cash crop yield, but hopefully by 
putting this input of cover crops in, we can either protect that yield or over the long term improve soil quality, but also cover crops can be a part of an effective integrated pest management system. So hopefully if maybe someday we can start to reduce herbicide use or prolong the effectiveness of a certain mode of action of herbicides or something where we have, you know, we don't have herbicide resistant weeds as soon. That's kind of the goal. So integrating it in. So it's not meant to be a silver bullet cure all. That's definitely not anything that I'm saying, but it can be, we know they're good for soil and having improved soils, I think is what every farmer wants. One last consideration here, Deanne, and that is selecting cereal rye seed for the purpose we're discussing here. Are there options, and is that something that producers need to contemplate? Yes, you can. You know, there are different cereal rye varieties out there, and you can also get VNS, which is variety not stated seed. And if you're going to get that, now it's going to be cheaper, but you'd want to start with VNS seed with a good germination rate purchased from a reputable seed dealer. That means that it's been cleaned, it's tested for germination, and has a seed tag, even though it says VNS. Um, but you you could get a different variety as well if you wanted to. Um, so I would say work with your local retailers on something like that to figure out. There might even be certain things that they have found work well in locally in, in certain soil types. So I think that, you know, reaching out to them for those help with those decisions is a, is a good idea. And the, the time to order seed is... Definitely upon you. I mean, it's it's now, if not a month ago. So it's time to get that and have it ready. So the best thing you can do is plant it right after the crop comes off. Once again, the approach we've been discussing here is using cereal rye as a cover crop between corn harvested this fall and next spring's soybean planting. And as Deanne notes, there is a new publication from K-State in cooperation with the Midwest Cover Crop Council on this very subject. It has all the details that you'll want to know about it, producers, and it can be found at the K-State Research and Extension online bookstore. So look for it. Deanne, thanks for coming over, as always. Thanks for having me. Soil Management Specialist Deanne Presley, K-State Research and Extension, talking this over with us on this part of Agriculture Today. Man, it's hot out here. Heat stress affects more than just humans. It also affects livestock. Extreme heat, humidity, wind speeds, and cloud cover all make a difference in air temperature. To control problems, make sure your livestock have shade and water provided at all times. This will help prevent problems in breeding, meat production, and reduce chances of death. Please take all these into consideration for livestock production. Brought to you by K-State Animal Science Leadership Academy participants. Agriculture Today resumes now on the K-State Radio Network with a couple of topics relevant to you cow-calf producers as covered in the latest Cattle Chat podcast from K-State's Beef Cattle Institute. One ties into something that a host of you producers are in the thick of right now, putting up native grass for hay. The other, a common health concern for cattle out on summer pasture. The panel today includes cow-calf specialist Bob Weber, livestock economist Dustin Pendle, and veterinarians Bob Larson and Brad White. This is a great question from one of our listeners, and we talked a few episodes ago about hay storage, how to kind of manage that, but we're going to dive a little bit further into that today because I thought we had a really good questions here, and it was related to storing round bales outside, and the question was, what, what do you think, string versus wrap? So I'll throw that to you guys. And Bob Weber, I know you have used a little of both of those. What's your top of the head thought here? Yeah, I'm, I like that wrap just from the how much water it helps shed. If you know those bales are really tight, that wrap does a great job keeping the bale integrity together and shedding water, and also makes them a lot easier to um, transport. I've got a, I have to borrow a tractor and use pallet forks and so bale integrity is really important because uh, picking up one that's falling apart and sticking in a bale feeder when you got you know 20 minutes to be at the office is no fun so <laughs> yeah, that's I'm, right i'm a big fan of that wrap i don't like you know cutting it off and it's something you know in the winter time if it's frozen it can be a real pain but the, the storage and, and waste prevention that it provides uh, i think sort of outweighs some of those challenges so 
some of this might depend a little bit. I mean, if I'm going to go out and buy a baler, it's going to be more expensive to buy an, uh, a net wrap baler than a than a twine tie baler. But on the other side of it, I, I I can go a little bit faster. It doesn't take nearly as many wraps at the end once the bale's formed with the net wrap, and then I'm ready to go on to the next bale. And so there's some speed and efficiency for me when I'm baling. So you know, I I, I kind of I like the net wrap, but there are some cost sides that make the twine a little bit better. And, and like a lot of things, if you do the twine wrap well enough, you get some of the same benefits of a net wrap, but with a little less cost. So I, I could go either way. The other thing to think about a little bit is where is it going to be stored? I think our listener question was being stored outside, which might tilt the advantage a little bit more towards net wrap. If it's going to be stored inside uh, where it doesn't have to be as tight and to keep the, you know, because I'm not worried about rain coming in on it, then maybe twine is a, a less expensive option if it's going to be stored inside anyway. So I, how, what is the cost differential? Dustin, do you have any idea? Just looking, did some quick research, uh, com- comment that Bob made with the speed. Uh, there was a study out of Wisconsin that says you can bail up to 32% more bales. And so if you take that into consideration, the, the speed, because you got labor expenses, you've got uh, fuel as well. So a couple of those would be probably two big expenses in addition to the uh, equipment. And so if you, you buy a new baler, you're gonna, you could add on another $5,000 for that wrapping mechanism. And so you gotta take that into consideration as Bob pointed out. The other thing to think about, it's probably a little harder to put a dollar value to, but when you're out bailing hay, and we've done this, I don't know how many times, and you're just trying to hurry up and get done because you're trying to beat the rain. And if, it, if the wrapping is 32%, you can go a lot much faster you know, that might be something to think about as well. Some of the studies say that by going from twine to the net wrapping, you know, where it's that the twine might be 50, cents, 50 to 60 cents a bale, it could be a buck and a half a bale. So an extra dollar a bale for the wrapping as, a composed, as opposed to the, the twine. So does the, does the wrapping, is it going to store that much better? What, are, what about my hay losses? Let's say, and, and Bob, you mentioned outside versus inside, and I want to come back to that. But let's say I'm outside. How much is that going to save me net wrap versus twine? Well, one thing I want to maybe point out is, is how tight the bale is is probably the most important, whether it's twine or, or net wrap is second most important. But it may be easier to get a good tight wrap with the, the net wrap. And also the, the type of hay. So uh, some of the work that's been done is looked at alfalfa. And so you've got a leafy, high quality, a lot of nutrients to lose. And maybe that's where a net wrap really shines, uh, where uh, an alfalfa type of hay. If you've got a lower quality hay, uh, sometimes a prairie hay or something like that, to be honest, there's less nutrients to lose to start with. And so maybe the, the drop off isn't as steep with a little more weathering. And so the, the type of hay matters, you know, are you talking about a really high quality legume type of hay or are you talking a more mature, lower quality hay? And, and the more things I've got going for me, so if I'm storing it inside, then it doesn't really matter how well it sheds rain. If I'm storing it on a rock base or something like that, I'm not as worried about water coming up from the bottom. So it's, it's a little bit of a trade-off. So a really good tight net wrap is going to always look the best, but it's also got some additional costs. So an outside storage, just as you mentioned, is not the same across the board. So how much sunlight can I get to it? Can I get it even? Can I get water to drain away from it? Dustin? So, so there, that study that I was talking about that looked at uh, the speed, how much faster you can wrap uh, in addition to some of the costs, they also looked at losses if you store it outside on the ground, and the average time total dry matter losses for bales that are stored outside using twine were about 11.3% compared to the net wrap of 7.3%. So there is that coming back to your uh, storage. Yeah, so a little bit less, and and that's going to vary as far as where you are in the country. Correct. And, And I think we've talked about it from the aspect of if you make it, you might have one answer. So you have that additional bailing equipment, you have additional costs. If you're buying it, there's really no downside to buying the net wrap versus twine if there's no price differential on the two. And if you're storing it, 
I would put a lot of my efforts on what does my storage facility look like? What does that base look like even outside? Can I get water to drain away more so than some of the other differences? We also had another listener question and from somebody who's a third generation rancher looking to take over as they go to the future. And, and they, their question was related specifically to foot rot. So they have some river bottom pastures. They have some creeks in the wetter years that may come and you kind of get those marshy bottom areas. And the question was, how can I prevent foot rot and what are some of the things that, that we deal with when we have to treat it? So Bob, I, I want to turn to you and say, what is foot rot first? Give us maybe just a brief overview of what it is and then we'll talk about some of the prevention. Well, foot rot is basically an infection between the claws of a feet of, of a cow or bull. But this question, you know, also says, you know, so river bottoms or around uh, water sources or place like that that can get pretty muddy and wet because the organism that causes this is in the soil. It's it's hardy. It lives in the soil. It's there all the time. And so if that cow causes any kind of a wound between her claws and so just stones, anything that can cause a, a wound will give that germ a chance to get started. And it's the and mud so, because those claws on the bottom are hard. If they When they squish down in the mud, that space between the claws is like the space between your fingers. So you can imagine mm -hmm. it doesn't take much to damage that space between your fingers. Uh, whereas if they're on nice hard ground, that space never touches the ground. Right. You squish right. down exactly. in mud, you hit that middle space on the ground. Yeah. So when you think about what's causing this, then you know, that also brings up some of the, the ways you prevent it, including iodine. And iodine is approved for use as a prevention for foot rot. And it can be included in mineral mixes. And a lot of times it's in your salt or mineral mix. It can also be just added to a feed supplement as well. And there's a little bit of mixed opinion about how effective the iodine is at preventing foot rot. Probably some ability, but again, like any feed given antibiotic, it depends on how much the cow is eating. Does she get the full dose and is she protected? So people I respect say, well, it's, it might be a preventative at best, certainly not a treatment. So if you've got foot rot going through a group of cows, having iodine in the salt or feed won't clean it up, won't treat the problem, but it may help in preventing the problem. Prevention but it's is not really gonna, It's about, not going to prevent them from damaging their feet. It's not going to prevent some of the issues that come along with that because that bacteria is in the soil, right? So it's not going to be a perfect exactly. preventative. It's not a perfect preventative. It, it's, it's a tool we've got, and we use it frequently. Uh, but it, real prevention is about kind of protecting the cow's feet. The good thing is treatment-wise, it, it's, it's inconvenient to, to get either a cow or calf in to treat them for foot rot, but usually they respond really well to any number of different antibiotics we have. Occasionally, you'll have a case that's a little harder to heal up and, and may need more attention. But a lot of times, if you see a cow that's sore on her feet and you get her in and treat that, she'll respond pretty well and, and get back to being sound pretty quickly. Yeah, foot rot is one of the things that will make them really, really lame, and they can come back from it pretty, pretty yeah. well. If you treat I mean, it, they'll come back pretty well. From the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State, Brad White, Bob Larson, Dustin Pendle, and Bob Whipper. As always, we'd encourage you to take in the entire Cattle Chat podcast. It is found at ksubci.org, ksubci.org. And we'll be back in a few moments with more here on Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson with you. Now today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
As agriculture continues to grapple with the fallout from the economic shutdown forced by the pandemic, a recent report from the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City suggests that the industry will see financial pressure for the remainder of 2020. Working capital on farms this year already projected to decline by about 16 percent. That was as of the start of the year. If the projection holds, according to the Fed report, working capital on farms would be 72 percent less than in 2012. The KC Fed reported expanding financial difficulties for livestock producers, and that could add stress in agricultural lending portfolios that already had increased before the pandemic, says the Fed. Now, the report adds that farmers and ranchers in the Federal Reserve's 10th district, including Kansas, Colorado, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Wyoming, and parts of western Missouri and northern New Mexico, have continued to see a decline in income and in loan repayment rates. The KC Fed collects information on expected changes in those loan repayment rates for specific types of farms, including livestock operations, at the end of the third quarter. Prior to the outbreak of COVID-19, they say, agricultural lenders in the 10th district already were more pessimistic about credit conditions in the livestock sector. The report goes on to say, moreover, according to information gathered at the onset of developments related to COVID, farm income and loan repayment rates declined at a faster pace than in recent quarters. Conditions in the livestock sector continued to deteriorate in the second quarter, it says, along with the developments related to COVID and the disruptions could put more pressure on farm finances and farm lending portfolios moving forward. Noting here, a University of Missouri Food and Agriculture Policy and Research Institute, or FAPRI, forecast in June said that livestock revenues could decline as much as 8% in 2020 as a result of the pandemic shutdown. Senate Agriculture Committee ranking member Debbie Stabenow has reiterated her stance to Politico that she will not back any additional aid for farmers and ranchers in the next COVID aid plan unless there's an increase for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. That's a stance that Stabenow has taken since late July as the Senate plan was being developed. However, she notes it appears that Republicans are now indicating an openness, as she put it, and that there are good discussions going Going on right now. Her frustrations are tied to the USDA so far not doling out most of the aid in the CARES Act that was passed in March. She said she wants to keep the aid mix around 50 50 for farm aid and for nutrition assistance. Stabenow has been critical of the USDA aid efforts, in particular the market facilitation programs for 2018 and 19. She maintains that that aid was unevenly distributed across the sector and was tilted toward farmers that had not suffered huge trade losses. The USDA has just added some new crop insurance payment flexibilities to an already long list of moves to help producers during these stressful times. The USDA's Gary Crawford has more on that. Low commodity prices, unusual market conditions are making it harder for some farmers to pay for vital crop insurance policies and so... We want to make sure we take care of those producers and give them time to get some crops harvested this fall and be able to pay those premiums. Martin Barbary runs the USDA's Risk Management Agency. It's authorizing crop insurance providers to do some things that will help producers in that regard, and here is one of the new ones. Premiums that would be due, like the August 15th billing date, which is the big one. I mean, that's a lot of the corn, soybean, grain, sorghum, a lot of crops across the country. Billing date's August 15th, which makes them due October 1st. So... What will happen is is they won't be required to make that payment until December 1st and won't have to pay any interest on that premium for that period of time, which normally they would. For more information on some other new crop insurance flexibilities, go online to rma.usda.gov, rma.usda.gov. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Chinese Vice Premier Liu He will participate in talks August the 15th to assess the progress of the Phase 1 trade agreement with China. That's according to a report by the Wall Street Journal. The two will meet via video conference. The focus expected to be on China's purchase commitments of U.S. agriculture, energy, and manufactured goods. Next up for you, this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. Here's Greg Akagi. Greg? 
Sage Collins is joining us. She is from Chanute and will be a junior at Kansas State University, but this summer is serving as an intern with Kansas Soybeans. Sage, what was your interest in wanting to be an intern with Kansas Soybeans? Part of my interest was that not only are they involved in agriculture, but they're also a nonprofit. So I was really able to combine my passions of wanting to learn more about the nonprofit industry and growing my experiences in the agriculture industry. So what were some of your responsibilities that you've had during your internship? There have been a wide range of things that we've been responsible for this summer. The first thing that we started off with was the Kansas Congressional Report, where we were able to go through and collect all of the agricultural information for 2019 when it comes to Kansas. And then we were able to take all of that information that we put together And it turned out to be about a 55-page report. And we were able to summarize that in a Zoom conference that we had with our senators and representatives from Kansas. And then from there, we really were able to pick and choose what we wanted to do due to this summer being a little different. We were pretty much stuck inside the office for most of the summer, which is fine because we got to know each other really well. And we got the chance to go visit farmers that are members of Kansas Soybean, and we got to interview them. And then with that, we took the information we got from them and turned it into material that consumers could understand and enjoy. But with all that, that sounds like it's in alignment with what you're studying as an ag econ major and nonprofit and other things that you mentioned in your studies at Kansas State University. It actually helped me figure out what I want to do. It really helped me understand that I have a passion for being able to relate as someone who has an ag background, who's also a consumer, and to see that, wow, some people really do have important questions for farmers that need to be answered. And when farmers are able to give those answers in a way that consumers can connect with, that's really where the coming together of ag and consumers happen. And that was something really exciting for me to figure out that that is something I want to do in the future. That is Sage Collins who joins us. She is a junior at Kansas State University and is from Chanute. This summer serving as an intern with Kansas Soybeans on the latest edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Coming your way next on Agriculture Today, the weekly horticulture segment for you, and tempting you into trying out fall gardening, vegetable gardening, that is. And along with us once more, K-State Research and Extension horticulturist Ward Upham to promote this idea. And, and folks, after they've gone through their spring plantings and still in the middle of harvesting from those, often don't think about the opportunities to extend that vegetable production further, but there's a chance to do that very thing, Ward. There certainly is, and there are some advantages to fall gardening, one of which is that those vegetables that we plant now are going to mature in cooler, less stressful weather. Usually when you think of our spring crops, one of the things we're concerned with is that we may be maturing those plants when it gets too hot. And so that can cause some problems for us. The problem with fall gardening is getting those plants off to a good start. That's what you have to worry about. So before we talk about what we can grow, what are those ground rules for getting those plants off to a productive start? So first of all, you're going to plant a little bit deeper than you do in the spring. And the reason for that is that we want that seed to stay cooler and to stay moist longer. And so plant a little bit deeper, plant more thickly, and then thin later. You're not going to have everything come up and survive. And so if you plant a little bit more thickly, you're going to be sure that you get enough plants. If planting seed, you may want to cover that seed with something like vermiculite or compost or peat moss, something to prevent crusting in heavy soils. Because when you're getting those plants started, you're going to be doing a lot of watering. And if it's a heavy soil, it's going to tend to crust. So if you cover that seed with one of those things, then you don't have to worry about crusting. 
you also may have to provide some protection from rabbits. Uh, they're going to love this stuff. And so you may have to put up either fencing or they also have like a motion sensing sprinkler that you can put out. Just remember to turn it off when you go out in the garden. <laughs> right. And then also fertilizing. You know, that's one of the things we need to think about. Really, there's no need to fertilize before you plant. There's usually enough fertilizer left from the spring. They don't have to fertilize before you plant. However, you may need to side dress. Somewhere between two to four weeks after planting, you may have to give a little bit of nitrogen fertilizer. The easy way to do that is just to use one of those liquid fertilizers and just mix it according to what the label says and just apply it over the top of the row. And that's going to be enough. And so those are the things that you may want to do a little bit differently. So that gets the plant hopefully off to a good start. But you mentioned watering. We've had good rainfall recently, but if it's any kind of a typical end of summer, it'll dry out soon. So one has to watch what they're doing with watering these newly planted vegetables. Really important when you're getting those seeds started. You want to try to keep that soil moist but not waterlogged. And so you can't overdo it. It's not easy when it's really hot, but you can't overdo it. So try to keep that soil moist but not waterlogged. And then once those plants come up, which they do relatively quickly now that those soils are warm, then you slowly back off on watering. You want to watch those plants that they start to wilt. They need a little bit more water. And so gradually back off until you're about watering maybe once a week. What can be and can't be grown at this point of the season? We're now into the early part of August. Some vegetables can safely be planted with good expectations, some not so much. So right now, you can seed spinach and the late maturing lettuce. So when we're talking about late maturing lettuce, talking about head lettuce or semi-head lettuce, not the leaf lettuce. Leaf lettuce is going to be planted later. So those can go in right now. Now, if you can find transplants, next week would be a good time to put in things like cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower. But you have to have transplants. You're not going to go from seed now. If you can't find them, make a note for next year that to seed those out in the garden area about mid-July. Now, don't space them like they're going to eventually be uh, spaced out. You're going to plant them in a small area fairly thickly because, again, you're not going to have all of them come up. And so you're going to grow them for about a month in that small area, and then you're going to transplant the ones you want into where they're going to go ahead and mature. And so that gives you a way to start those uh, cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower. And those really do like that cool fall weather. They will be a higher quality than you normally get in the spring. And then the last thing is mid to late August, you can seed radishes, leaf lettuce, mustard, and turnips. If you like mustard and turnips, they will still be around in probably uh, Thanksgiving. They are really cold hardy. If you like the greens or if you like the turnips, they can be something that really provides you fresh greens well into the fall. But those latter four, the radishes, leaf lettuce, mustard, turnips, all grown from transplant as well or from seed? These are from seed. So you're going to grow these from seed and they mature quickly enough and they are cold hardy enough that that works really well. There are some vegetables that can't be successfully planted at this point, though. It's a bit on the late side, right? That's right. For example, potatoes. Even though they're a cool season crop, we're really too late to put those in the ground. And anything that's warm season, we're a little too late. I mean, cucumbers, if you backed up maybe a couple of weeks, we might be able to get away with those, but we're, now we're too late. With all of these that you've cited, though, Ward, they are cool hardy. And even if we have an early freeze, they'll bear up fairly well? They will. And so some of these, like I mentioned, the turnips and mustard, they'll take down into the low 20s. I mean, they really are hardy. But most of these will take a light frost with no problem at all. And Ward, we have had, thankfully, cooler weather, very pleasant conditions of late, and that may have slowed down insect activity and other pest problems, but those will likely be back And these vegetables are quite vulnerable to those as well, aren't they? They can be, and so probably not as much of a problem as they have with the spring. For example, the cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower, they can have cabbage worm, imported cabbage worm, diamondback moth. Those are three of the caterpillars I get on them and feed on them. Fairly easy to control when you start seeing those leaves that are starting to be eaten on, you can use a number of products. Uh, BT, found a dipel and thuricide, anything with spinosad, which is another organic 
insecticide can also be used. And so you can find that in, in Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. It's also under the name of Spinosad. You can find it in different places. And so those are easy to control. But by and large, you'd like folks that have not tried fall gardening, particularly these greens that we're talking of today, to give this a shot, for they may be pleasantly surprised by the productivity of these late gardens. I think so. Ward, as always, thanks for coming over. You bet. He's Ward Upham, horticulturist with K-State Research and Extension. Featured on this week's horticulture segment. And with that, our Thursday edition comes to a close. Please be back with us tomorrow, won't you? In the meantime, you might check out our podcast service at agtoday.net. Once more, agtoday.net. Eric Atkinson here bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Thank you.